So welcome everyone and welcome to the second plenary session of the course on markets under critics. Today we will be joined by a talk by Dr. Jason Brennan. He's the Robert J. and Elizabeth Flanagan Family Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. His work focuses on the intersection of normative political philosophy and the empirical social sciences, specifically on questions about voter behavior, pathologies of democracy, and the consequences of freedom. So welcome, Dr. Brennan. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me back. It's uh, nice to be able to talk to you guys about this virtually. I think I've actually given this talk at Penn in person before, too. Um, I do have some slides. Uh, they're mostly pictures, so I think it'll be plenty fun. And what I want to talk to you guys about today is the question of socialism and capitalism in what you might call ideal and realistic theory. And what I mean by that is a theory of what makes something ideally good. What would a perfectly just society look like? Because fundamentally, people have this view that even, even people who are defenders of capitalism have a view that socialism is the best thing for good people and capitalism is the best thing for bad people like us. So is that right? How would we know? And that's what I want to talk about today. Um, and I'm going to tre treat it sort of as a debate between the philosopher Jerry Cohen and me. So let's get going. All right. I like to, there's this old uh, movie called Capitalism, A Love Story by Michael Moore. And uh, it's a documentary where he kind of goes through all of the evils of capitalism and corporations and so on. And he may be a little bit of exaggeration here and there. But at the end, he says, we need to replace capitalism with something else because capitalism is immoral and you can't fix immorality. We need to replace it with economic democracy. And it's funny that he says economic democracy because he doesn't use the word socialism. Why not? Why doesn't he just say we should be socialist? And the reason is because for many people, at least at this time, that was kind of a dirty word. Uh, I think that's changed in the past decade or so. I think socialism's gotten uh, kind of higher status than it had a decade ago. Why was it a dirty word? Well, I think he knows that many of his viewers are going to accept the following kind of story. They go, look, in the 20th century, we had a contest between capitalism and socialism. We had 90 or so capitalist economies, and every single one of those economies, even if they had various problems, their people got richer. The poor people in those economies got richer. Capitalism went 90 for 90 in the 20th century. Socialism, on the other hand, went zero for 90 in the 20th century. It never really worked out. Uh, the countries that did well, that people call socialist, aren't even really socialist. And instead, you had mass murder, uh, violations of human rights, and all sorts of other problems. So I think he knows that the word has this kind of dirty meaning to a lot of people. And right now, uh, if you look around the world and ask, where would you probably want to live? You'd probably want to live in one of the more capitalist countries. So every year, the uh, Canadian think tank, the Fraser Institute, hires a bunch of academic economists to try to rate um, all the countries in the world in terms of how capitalistic, how free market are they. The countries that are in blue here are the ones that are in the top 25% most free market. To be clear, almost none of these countries are really like laissez-faire capitalists. They're all, to some degree, mixed economies. Uh, the ones in red are the ones that are like the least capitalistic. And the ones that are green, as you can see, they're the second group. And then there's the third group that's yellow. When you look at this, you probably, if you had to choose where to live, you'd probably choose to live in one of the blue countries. Is that an accident? And notice, by the way, that many of the countries that people in the United States would call socialist aren't, right? So the Scandinavian countries, Canada, and so on, these are really free market welfare states. In fact, the differences between them and us are actually not that high. All right. So what else do people say about capitalism? Why is it people think it won the debate in the 20th century? Well, for one, uh, we're just a lot richer than we used to be. It, if you think about economic history uh, and you want to summarize it, it's pretty much for almost all of human history, everyone was dirt poor. What we consider extreme poverty was the norm of human condition for almost all of our history until relatively recently. This graph only goes back to 1960 because there's no point in even going beyond that. It's just flat. And then sometime around 1960, like the world explodes in terms of growth. So now uh, in current US dollars, GDP per capita worldwide is roughly $18,000, whereas it was a fraction of that until pretty recently. Um, almost everyone was living in extreme poverty until relatively recently. And you know the share of the world that's living in extreme poverty is now the lowest it's ever been. It's amazing. Uh, in the year 1960, most of the world was still living in extreme poverty, and now it's less than 10%. We have more people and they're living better than ever. And the places where they're living the best are the capitalist places. So isn't it just obvious capitalism's better? You know, we're going to answer that in a second, but that's what a lot of people would argue. Further, uh, it's there's a very strong correlation between economic freedom and like in terms of like how capitalist you are and the GDP per capita of your country. The places that are richer are the places that are capitalist. 
right? But some people might go, ah, oh, but you're just looking at averages. You're just looking at people in the middle or the, the mean person, a hypothetical statistical figure. What about the worst off? How are they doing? Well, what if we focus just on them? Well, even then capitalism still looks better. So the numbers here in this particular graph are telling you how much income do people at the 10th percentile of income in the most, second most, third most, and least capitalist countries make in PPP adjusted US dollars. In other words, taking the purchasing price of a dollar in the United States and then treating that as the standard and adjusting the cost of living to all their countries to make them comparable to that so that a dollar here equals a dollar there. You do that and then you look at how much money people make and in the most capitalist countries, the, the people at the bottom 10th percentile of income are making about $14,000 or so. That's already about mean and median world product, right? They're already, so basically it works out that if you're at the poverty line in the United States, you're already in the top 20% of income earners worldwide. And this, if anything, understates how well the poor do in the most capitalist countries, because the most capitalist countries are also richer and have more generous welfare programs. These numbers don't include any kind of transfers or welfare benefits, which are more generous. So in fact, the gap is bigger than what you see here. All right. Now you might say, well, maybe I'm an egalitarian and I care about uh, the share of income rather than the total amount. Well, if that's the case, you don't really have much reason to prefer any of these things anyways, because it basically works out that in the most capitalist countries and the least capitalist countries, people get somewhere between two to 3% of the poorest people get about two to three percent of the pie. It's just the pie is much bigger in some places than others, right? As a matter of fact, despite what people say, it looks like the relationship between inequality and capitalism is not really positive. You know, I, I run these graphs year after year. It's kind of about flat. Some years it's slightly negative, some years it's flat. So maybe it doesn't do the bad things people say it does. Poverty rates, on the other hand, are really low in capitalist countries and much higher in non-capitalist countries. And that's even though the way poverty is defined is often different from country to country, and sometimes poverty rates are defined in terms of inequality. Nevertheless, people in capitalist countries are much less likely to be poor than elsewhere. So finally, one big other argument is just money buys you wealth, and but, but it doesn't just buy you wealth, it buys you life. As a matter of fact, Empirically speaking, a robust finding over the past 200 years is that the richer your country is, the more likely you are to live long. So what greater freedom is there than living an extra 20 to 30 years? And that's something you're getting purchased by having extra money, which comes from being in a capitalist country, right? So with all of that, what else is there to be said? Isn't it just obvious capitalism is better? But nevertheless, almost everyone has this nagging suspicion that despite what I just said, it's missing something important that in some way capitalism is still a really bad system and it's not the way we should be living. They often can give it like this. If we were living in a utopian society, if people were really good and really just, would we be capitalist or would we be something else? The idea here is something like certain institutions that we live under exist in order to deal with human depravity, right? For instance, think about the criminal justice system. Um, regardless of what your particular view about the criminal justice system is and whether you think we should have jails or more police or fewer police or an alternative to police, you probably believe the following is true. If people were just good, we wouldn't have a criminal justice system. That's an institution that exists to deal with flaws in human nature. If people were good, we wouldn't have it. Or if you ask the question, what kind of military would utopia have? The answer is it wouldn't. If people were all morally good, they would never start unjust wars. And if you never start an unjust war, you don't need a military. So in a world where everyone was morally good, there would be no military. So militaries and criminal justice systems are systems or institutions that exist in order to deal with flaws in human nature. Good people would not have them. So one of the questions people often have is, are capitalist institutions like this? Are they basically a solution or partial solution to a problem of human depravity? And if so, what does that say about the fundamental morality of the market? Does it mean that the market is fundamentally kind of a bad thing? Or, you know, it's something we use because we are bad. If we were good, we wouldn't have it. So I think the best book defending this view that I know of is a book to, uh, written by the Marxist philosopher Jerry Cohen or G.A. Cohen. Uh, it was originally published independently, um, and then it got turned into this little miniature book. I love the cover of it. You know, it's like one little rose. Why not socialism? Uh, he wrote it. It was published posthumously right after he passed away. And, and it's just kind of his final plea. And the thing is, Cohen, if you don't know who he is, he was probably the most important from in the standpoint of analytic philosophy. He's the best Marxist philosopher of the past hundred years. Uh, I think that, that's a pretty uncontroversial thing to say. Uh, he's, you know, he was really good at analyzing and like updating Marx. 
But oddly, at the end of his life, he pretty much conceded that bourgeois economics is basically sound. And by bourgeois economics, he just means what you study in regular economics classes, as opposed to Marxist alternative economics. He admits that basically Marx's fundamental way of thinking about the economy doesn't really hold up to empirical scrutiny. But in his view, Marx was a really good moral critic of markets. Now, if you know anything about Marx, Marx didn't like to put position himself that way. Marx's view of himself was, I, Karl Marx, don't do moral philosophy. I am a scientist explaining how the world works. Even when I use the word exploitation, that's a scientific term. Cohen disagrees. Cohen thinks Marx wasn't, turns out not to be that great of an uh, economist, but he's a great moral philosopher, and his moral critique of markets remains and is intact even, even if you grant all those facts that I just gave you, all those charts. And there, I bring up those charts in part because Jerry Cohen would agree with that. He agrees that those numbers obtain. And nevertheless, he thinks markets are fundamentally flawed. And he thinks you agree. He thinks even if you call yourself a capitalist or something like that, you probably agree that capitalism is fundamentally a compromise with human nature. So why? What's his argument? So he very famously bases this on this kind of camping trip thought experiment. And he basically wants you to imagine that we're living, we're going to go work on a camping trip together. And first we kind of live under socialist principles and then we live under capitalist principles. And he asks you, which one is better? All right. So here's how it goes. He's like, imagine that we all really love each other and really care about one another. Um, we're genuinely committed to one another's welfare. And we decide to go on an extended camping trip with one another. When we show up at the camping trip, because we care about each other, we're going to make sure everyone has something like an equally good time. Uh, we're going, even though we might bring separate goods, we're going to share those goods equally, right? So maybe someone brings a guitar, but everyone can have access to it. Someone brings a Frisbee, everyone can play it. Someone brings a bunch of steaks, we're going to share the steaks. Further, because we care about one another and we're genuinely good, we're not going to free ride or take advantage of one another's generosity. And finally, um, we're going to make sure that the burdens of our common life together are shared equally. We're not going to do things like say, you know, Bob over here, he's the least popular of our friends where we don't like him as much as everyone else. We're going to make him do latrine duty. He'll be in charge of like washing the dishes and cleaning up uh, where people go to the bathroom. And then Jenny, she's really cool. So we won't make her do any work at all. We, we're not going to do anything like that. Instead, we're going to share the burdens and benefits of living together in this camp in an equal way, making sure everyone has an equally good time and making sure no one falls through the cracks. It's like he would basically ask people, would you like to go on a camping trip like that? And most people would say yes. And if they say no, then she's like, well, I don't, I don't trust people to behave that well. He's like, no, 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 I'm not asking, do you actually trust your friends to behave this way? Maybe they wouldn't. He's saying, would you like to go on a camping trip that was the way I so described? And most people say yes. He's like, aha, notice they're living by socialist principles. Everything is shared equally. All the work is shared equally, et cetera, et cetera. He then says, I want you to imagine that the camping trip goes bad. They start acting like uh, capitalists, right? Uh, by the way, if you know what this album is, it's a great album. You should listen to it. Uh, it's like, so imagine that the people start behaving the way that people do in capitalist countries. For instance, maybe there's a character, a person like Leslie, who's really good at cracking nuts. This is his example. And she uh, is willing to crack more nuts so that all of us get to eat better at dinner time, but only if she doesn't have to do the most degrading work. Like She's like, I don't want to clean the latrines anymore like everyone else. And we pay her off. Or there's another person who is really good at catching fish. He's willing to catch more fish, but only if he uh, gets to eat more and better than others. Maybe there's a person who knows how to like find the fish and he's willing to teach people where the fish are and how to be better at fishing, but only if he gets some sort of extra reward. So in this case, that person might be like a college professor. Like, well, we might have knowledge that's useful for you, but we're not willing to give it to you for free. You better pay us uh, you know, $75,000 a year uh, tuition in order for us to give you this knowledge, right? But finally, let's say there's another guy, Morgan, who his dad had come to the camping site like 30 years prior and he found a pond and he stocked it full of fish. And then at the end, like because of that, he knows where this pond is and it's overflowing with fish. So he goes and gets fish from there. And when we're eating dinner together, we all have relatively small plates, but he just has an overflowing plate full of more food than the rest of us. And he likes to show off and brag how much better he is. He's like, haha, look at how much better my plate is. Right. So in this case, Morgan's behavior would be kind of like what happens if you have a Swiss watch. I do. I don't have it on right now. Or like a fancy German car. Or if you go to like an Ivy League school like Penn. Right. Like, why do you go to Penn as opposed to like Penn State? Because it's fancier and that makes you look look better. Right. That's that's the real reason. Um, so we'll be doing that kind of stuff. He's like, that is sort of a capitalist camping trip. If you think about it. He's like, when people behave this way, it was great. And when they start behaving the way people do in a capitalist society, it kind of sucks. 
So at this point, he pauses and says, you, the reader, which camping trip would you prefer to go on? Would you prefer to go on this camping trip when people behave according to socialist principles of sharing and caring and equality? Or would you work, rather work in this camping trip where people are selfish, self-centered, try to get as much as they can for themselves and try to show off and improve their status at the expense of others? And almost everybody says this one, right? I've asked probably 10,000 people this in person. And I think I've had like two people say this over this. Right. Sometimes people say this, but they're confused about what he's talking about. Very few people genuinely prefer this camping trip. And he's like, okay, so if you could live in one way or another, you would pick the first way. You would rather live like this than live like this. But these are the behaviors of socialism, and these are the behaviors of capitalism. So then he asks, wouldn't it be nice if we could make the whole world like this? He says, I want you to put aside for a second the question of whether it's feasible to make the world like this. Just ask the question, is it nice? Would that be the way you would prefer to live if you could, right? And so you, I can't, no, no, no. He's, I'm not asking if you can, I'm asking if you could, would you want this? And almost everyone says yes. So then he asks, this is really his fundamental question. Is there some reason why it wouldn't be desirable to run a large scale society this way? And he says, I want you to put aside and separate two questions. One question is, is it desirable? And the second question is, is it feasible, right? Because lots of things can be desirable without being feasible. A good instance of this would be like, uh, uh, think of the force from Star Wars. Would you like to have the force? Like, wouldn't you like to be force sensitive and have telekinesis and that kind of stuff and be able to shoot lightning out of your fingers? I definitely would. If they, if someone can sell me the force powers right now for 10 grand, I've got a check waiting for you. Like, I would definitely like to have that. But it's not feasible, right? Obviously, we can't. Like, in fact, the force is incompatible with our universe. I had a physics professor in college who wrote a book on this. And he says, we're never going to find out that the Star Wars force is in our universe. It's completely incompatible with our physics. All right, fair enough. But we'd still like it. Or take a simpler case. Imagine I could cure world hunger by snapping my fingers. Wouldn't it be nice to do that? You know, obviously, I can't, but it can still be good. So we're actually, it's really easy to evaluate things as better and worse, even if they're unrealistic. You know, like if you watch the most recent Godzilla movie and you see Godzilla destroying Tokyo, you can sit there and go, oh, it's bad that he's destroying Tokyo, even though obviously nothing like Godzilla could ever exist. If you watch Dune, the most recent Dune movie or read the books, that's that physics is incompatible with our universe, but you can still judge things as good or bad. So the question of whether it's feasible and the question of whether it's desirable are separate. He says, so... Maybe he uses like this old Russian tale uh, to sort of illustrate this point again. He says, imagine that there's this fox and it, because it has a really good sense of smell, it, it can smell what are the best, tastiest grapes. It can tell that these grapes are the best grapes that you could possibly eat right there. But he jumps up and down over and over again, trying to get these grapes. And every single time he misses, he can't jump high enough. So eventually the fox gives up and says, you know what? They're probably sour grapes anyways. The fox is making a mistake. It's true that he can't get those grapes, but the fact that he can't get them does not make them any less desirable, right? The fact that you can't get something doesn't mean it's not desirable, right? It might still be the best thing. It's just not in your reach. So let's illustrate this with another example, I think, which comes closer to what's happening in socialism. Um, I'm borrowing this and modifying it from my former colleague, David Esland at Brown. Uh, so imagine this person over here is you, and you and I are trying to go on a picnic together. And up here on top of this hill, we see what is clearly the best picnic spot. It has just the right amount of sunlight and shade, has just enough bugs to feel like you're outside, but not so many that they're going to get in your food, just enough of a heat to feel warm, but not too much to feel sweaty, just enough of a breeze so you're comfortable, et cetera. It is the perfect picnic spot. But for us, we have all these obstacles in the way that might prevent us from getting there. First of all, we have to get past this marauding ogre with a battle axe. We get past the ogre, there's an alligator, and then we have to go down a deep ravine that has spikes at the bottom. And then we have to climb up this really, really steep hill. And around this hill, you can't see it because it's invisible, is this weird gaseous miasma. And the miasma has a weird effect on you depending on your level of character. If you are perfectly virtuous, it does nothing to you at all. But if you're a flawed person, it makes you a murderous, power hungry psychopath like Mao Zedong or Stalin, right? So basically if you're morally good, nothing happens, but if you're morally bad, it makes you worse. And then finally, if you get past that, you're at the hill and you're at the perfect picnic spot. So Eslin would say, look, because the obstacles are so difficult and so heavy, it makes sense not even to try to get to the top of this spot. It makes sense to just give up. But nevertheless, this spot is still better than where we are. Notice those two claims are compatible. 
you can say that's a better place than where we are and we should not bother try to get there. Cohen is effectively at the end of his life sort of saying, maybe that's what socialism is. We, it's kind of like, if we were morally good, we would be socialist, but we're morally bad, right? That's the problem. We are bad. Socialism's great. We are too bad to make it work, right? Is it feasible? This is, he says, there's really two kinds of complaints about the feasibility of socialism. The first complaint is that it's incompatible because of an incentive problem. It's incompatible with human nature because we don't respond the right way to it. Socialism asks us to be kind and loving and sweet to one another, to not free ride and to do our part, but human beings being selfish and nasty end up acting worse in socialism. But that's because people are bad. If people were good, they wouldn't act that way, right? Um, he's like, a lot of principles are like this. You know, you can say things like, you know, maybe we should share more, but we know people won't. And the fact that people are unwilling to do something doesn't mean that they can't. He's like, that's a really important point uh, that he, he thinks is we often miss. The fact that you're not willing to do something does not mean you're not able, right? You are able to donate more money to charity. You just probably won't because you don't want to. Putin is able to just not invade Ukraine. He just doesn't want to. Uh, the person who mugs you on the street is able to not mug you. They just choose to do so. These are all things within people's control. They just choose to do the wrong thing. So similarly, uh, when we've tried to have socialism on a large scale in the real world, it fails in part because people behave badly, but they could choose to do the right thing. They just won't. Why not? Because they're bad, right? So again, he's like, socialism requires nice behavior. We're not willing to be nice. This is a good system for good people. We are bad, right? The problem isn't socialism. The problem is us. Now, he admits, by the way, for those of you who've taken more economics classes, there is a different kind of problem with socialism, which is that in the absence of market prices, people might not be able to gauge in, in large scale planning. Um, this is often called the information problem of socialism, um, which is developed by um, an Austrian economist named von Mises back in the 20s. Uh, he actually agrees with this. He says, I agree that fundamentally markets are, uh, are necessary for large scale cooperation. And so for that reason, he ends up defending something called the Karen's market, where we have market competition with, with firms, but then the firms share all their profits with everyone equally. He thinks this can overcome it. So interestingly, he admits that you cannot have central planning on a large scale. It's not going to work because people aren't smart enough to make it work. That's a fundamental problem with socialism, not with us. But the other part, the fact that we're not nice enough is a problem with us, not with socialism. So he thinks if only we were good, we would have market socialism. Is he right? Well, I want to make fun of his argument by parodying it. Because um, I realized years ago that he's kind of doing something tricky. What he effectively did was ask you to compare capitalism in realistic circumstances to socialism with ideal people. And the real question is, what would capitalism with ideal people look like? And I remember I talked to him about this briefly. And he was like, yeah, I guess I did do that. But um, what would that even be? Does it even make sense? Isn't it like asking what the military would look like with ideal people? And then years later, I was watching the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse uh, CGI cartoon with my, at the time, one-year-old. And I realized it actually portrayed a utopian capitalist society that Jerry Cohen would like. And I'm like, aha, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Disney, for solving this problem. All right. So let me describe, do a parody kind of argument that goes the opposite direction. And this, I think, will show you what's wrong with Cohen's argument. So imagine that... Um, Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Clarabelle Cow, Goofy Dog, uh, Professor Von Drake, Willie the Giant, Donald Duck, and so on, all live together in a place we're going to call the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse Village. And the Clubhouse Village has both communal spaces and private spaces. So there are parks and things like that, which appear to be collectively owned by everyone, but there are also are private things. In particular, there's private ownership of the means of production. Clarabelle Cow, pictured here, owns a Moo Muffin factory and a Moo Mart um, sundry store. Minnie Mouse, pictured here, owns a boutique, get it, boutique, that sells bows, and she has a Daisy Duck as an employee. Professor Von Drake has this advanced nanotech machinery that can manufacture goods on demand. Willie the Giant is a bourgeois landowner who has a large farm. Donald Duck also owns a farm, and so on. And these characters, they do certain things communally, but they also buy, trade, and sell with one another. Right. So they don't just simply give everything away. If, if people are really in need, they will. But they also buy, trade and sell. These are they're done. They often interact with each other in a capitalist way. They live together in ways that no one would have any real objection to. There's no exploitation. There's no violence. There's no threats of violence. In fact, they're such morally good people. They don't even have a government. Right. A government being a thing that has a monopoly on the use of force and is used to in enforce rules. They don't do that. They're just they just do the right thing because it's right. And at most, if someone's confused, they just talk it over really quickly and it's taken care of. 
right? They live together under five principles. Uh, one principle is what we might call a principle of voluntary community, a principle that we're going to live and work together without violence and threats of violence. They live together under principles of mutual respect. They respect the differences everyone else has. The differences between them doesn't bring them apart. They treat everyone as an end in themselves and as a rights bearer, and nothing is needed to enforce this because they just recognize the moral status of others. They live under principles of reciprocity, where everyone wants to trade and trade with others, in part because no one wants to come to the world and say, just feed me. Everyone thinks, I want to be a person who helps make the world a better place if I can. I want the other people to benefit from my existence if I'm able to make it that way. And so they all work productively in ways that benefit the community, and they trade back and forth. However, they also have principles of social justice. If somebody falls through the cracks, they're going to make sure that they're brought back up. They make sure that their environment, this anarcho-capitalist environment that they work under, is set up in such a way that um, everyone can do really well by participating. Um, it's something that can be justified to everyone. And finally, they live under principles of beneficence, where if there's a problem, they work together to solve it. And you can watch the show and see how that goes. And in fact, there's nothing that ever happens that Jerry Cohn could complain about. Right? It's all great. Imagine this, cap this capitalist country or capitalist um, utopia became socialist. Suppose Minnie Mouse or Mickey Mouse imposes himself as a dictator and creates a five-year plan. And the plan doesn't work very well. So people become immiserated. And in order to like make sure that people go along with this plan, he has to take all of their property and nationalize it under his control. Of course, they resist because they think it's not going to work. And so he sends out teams of army, army people and others to just kill everyone who's in his way. And he ends up destroying, say, 20% of the population. He takes other people and he puts them in concentration camps to be re-educated. And really only the people that kind of kiss up to him end up having good lives, right? And so we have mass murder and mass chaos and lives become worse. That's what would happen if it were a socialist camping trip, right? Or sorry, a socialist village. Uh, so therefore, I would ask, which would you rather live under, this capitalist society or this socialist society? And everyone says, I'd rather live under this society than this one. QED, therefore, utopia is capitalist, right? So notice, you're probably not on board. You're probably like, wait, that's a trick. That's unfair. Yes, it is unfair, but the way that it's unfair is the same way that it was unfair for Cohen to make his argument. I just literally, in the book, I uh, uh, my book, Why Not Capitalism, I just literally take his text and reverse the words and like describe this stuff. Um, and it works. It works just as well as his argument. Because what I effectively did here was I described a utopian ideal capitalist society and then I compared it to Cambodia and the Soviet Union or China in like during the uh, first 30 or 40 years, or even now it has a lot of problems. Um, so I'm comparing utopian capitalism to realistic socialism, right? If you think that's a problem, you're right, but that's exactly what Jerry Cohen did. He compared utopian socialism to realistic capitalism, right? So that's really what his argument is. And almost every argument of this so sort that people make where they say, socialism is better than capitalism even though it doesn't work is when they they try to compare ideal socialism to realistic capitalism so this really is cohen's argument he says socialism with morally perfect people is better than capitalism with realistically flawed people i agree that sounds right therefore socialism is intrinsically more desirable than capitalism no that doesn't follow right the problem is all you're showing is that ideal socialism in other words socialism plus perfectly virtuous people is better than capitalism plus realistic people this leaves open the question of what's better, ideal capitalism or ideal socialism, and what's better, realistic capitalism and realistic socialism. In fact, Cohen wrote this in part because he admits at the end of his life, he's like, yeah, it looks like realistic capitalism beats realistic socialism. But I want to prove to you that socialism is still better anyways. Right. And it's not just Cohen that does this. Everybody does this. Politicians do it. Leaders throughout South America, leaders in the United States, even the philosopher John Rawls. Uh, if you look at his work, he's doing exactly the same thing. Uh, in his most recent book, uh, The um, Justice is Fairness, a Restatement, it's, it's actually funny if you get the physical copy of the book, because on page one page, I think it's page 137, if I remember correctly, he's like, what you should not do is compare an ideal of one system to a realistic account of the other. And then when you fold that, it touches a paragraph where he literally does that. It's like, I, I don't know. I don't know how that happened, where he compares his ideal system to what he thinks is like a realistic account of capitalism. All right. And that doesn't work. Everyone does this. The other big mistake that uh, Cohen makes is he often conflates socialism with being nice. Right. So I remember I was giving a talk in this in the American Philosophical Association many years ago, and somebody said, well, the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse Society isn't capitalist because they're nice to each other. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, 
by de you by definition, you mean capitalism is mean. They have private property in the means of production. They have a free market and they trade and they have make contracts. Like that's capitalism. No, 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 they're nice. Socialism is not kindness, love, fellow feeling. It's not oceans of lemonade. It's not community. Socialism is a particular way of distributing ownership claims over stuff and who gets to make decisions about that stuff. Capitalism is a different way of doing it. Capitalism is not by definition, greed, fear, selfishness, or callousness. It is an open empirical question what these institutions do to us, if anything. It's not by definition, one is the other, right? So if I were to say, imagine like if Cohen were describing his uh, socialist society and I said, no, that's not socialist because no one's murdering each other. They're not, socialism is by definition, mass murder. You would think that's a ridiculous argument. Fair enough. You're right. It would be a ridiculous argument, but it's also ridiculous when socialists make the parallel argument against capitalism. These are institutions that arrange the property rights in a certain way, and it's an empirical question what it does to us. An empirical question, by the way, that we can check. And for whatever reason, Cohen spent most of his life complaining that capitalism makes us greedy, nasty, and fearful, but he's a philosopher, and uh, he didn't really leave his armchair very much. Uh, however, people have left the armchair, and they've done significant studies on this, and I'll just summarize a few things. So here, by the way, is just a rating on things like generosity. How much money do people give to charity based upon how much, whether they live in a capitalist or non-capitalist society? And even here, I'm controlling for income because it's true that people in capitalist societies have more money. So you might just expect them to give more because they have more. Even controlling for that, what you get is people in the more capitalist societies are more giving and generous than people in non-capitalist societies. This is a persistent trend. I'm giving you a trend at one year. This trend persists every year. Um, there's a similar kind of ranking with just a different set of numbers, at different time. Um, more, maybe more interestingly is, uh, take like the work of Herbert Gintis and others. Gintis back in the 1960s was effectively a Marxist and he wanted to prove that Marx is right about this. So he went around the world playing games with people for money. Uh, games like the dictator game, the ultimatum game, the prisoner's dilemma games, these are, or the trust game. These are games where people, the players know the rules and they're playing with a real person, often anonymously, so there's no possible backlash afterwards. And you give them opportunities to either be trusting to each other or not, to try to take advantage of each other or not, to be fair or not, All right? I could spend a long time talking about how these games work. But an example, this would be uh, one game called the trust game. You have two players, you give the first player $10, and then you tell them they can send as much money as they want to the second player. However much they send to the second player will get multiplied by three. And then that player in turn can unilaterally send money back to the first player. If they're selfish, they won't send any money. And the second player, if he got some, would just keep it all for himself. If they're nice, what will happen is the first player will give all the money to the second player and the second player will give half back, right? So are you trusting? And if people trust you, are you trustworthy? So Gintis and others have gone all around the world and played these games for often significant amounts of money and checked what kinds of factors explain how people play. And as Gintis himself says, the biggest predictor that you will be trusting, fair, unconditionally generous, cooperative, and so on in these games is the extent to which you come from a market-oriented society. People who come from market-oriented societies play nice. People who come from traditional or socialist societies don't, right? Oops. All right, so Cohen, there's a lot of research on this. Cohen just doesn't pay any attention to it. So empirically speaking, it just doesn't look like his claim is correct. So I want to end by asking the question, all right, he, he's argued this in the abstract, right? And, and so far, what I've pointed out is Cohen's argument doesn't work, right? I haven't shown much about what utopia is like, but I pointed out the following. When people argue that socialism is good for good people and capitalism is sort of a functional system for bad people like us, they're comparing an ideal to a realistic account. They're not comparing the ideal to the ideal, right? So this shows maybe it leaves open the question of if we were morally perfect, if we were morally good, what kind of system would we have? And I want to make a brief argument that actually I think we would be closer to the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse Society than we would be to the socialist camping trip, right? In fact, I think the, the capitalist version of utopia is better than the socialist version of utopia, even though both are better than what we actually live under. So how do we define utopia? Now, what I mean by this following kind of Cohen's way of thinking about it is a world like ours with our kind of environment, our kind of natural environment and so on, where you imagine people have the same basic abilities. No one has any psychic powers. No one's like living specially long or anything like that. They're basically humans with our kind of physical and mental limitations. However, you take everyone's morality meter and you turn it up to 10. You just imagine everyone is disposed to do the right thing for the right reason all the time. They're not inclined to do something that's wrong. 
you know, so in the real world, people aren't like this. In the real world, people are subject to perverse incentives. They're rapacious and greedy and nasty and so on. We're imagining that away. We're just imagining whatever morality is, they're willing to do it because it's the right thing. So this is what we mean by a utopian society. And now the question is, what would that society look like? Would it be capitalist or socialist or would it have something else? If people were angels, what kind of system would they live under? In order to argue that it would be capitalist, you have to basically do two things. You have to give some kind of rationale for why they would want to have private property, specifically in the means of production. And you also want to explain why they'd want to have markets and some sort of like free market capitalistic um, trade system. If you can establish that, then you give an account for why they'd want to be capitalist. All right. So what do we mean by property rights? Um, we have to get into account what that is. Property rights are claims to have control over physical objects. Every system has property rights. Even for socialists, you have an issue of property rights. Why does our commune get to own this and exclude other people from it? Who has a claim to this and why? So property rights, you can think of as a bundle of different rights that go together. Um, so for instance, I own this phone, uh, which you can't see because of the system, uh, the background system. Okay, there it is. When I own a phone, um, what does it mean to say that I own it? Well, the fundamental part of what it is to own a phone is the right of exclusion. There's this small piece of the universe here that you can barely see, which I'm allowed to exclude other people from. I can, like, that's interesting. What allows me to do that? It also involves other rights, typically. Like, I'm free to use this phone at will, but you're not. If you want to use my phone, you have to get my permission. I'm free to just destroy the phone if I want to. I could just break it right now. I'm not going to, but I could. Uh, you're not. If you break my phone, you have to compensate me. If I break my phone, that's fine. I'm free to alter the phone at will. You're not. Um, I'm free typically to make money from the phone. I could use this to say ride Uber or something like that and make money from it. Um, you're not. Uh, I'm free to rent out the phone to others. Like if you wanted to borrow my phone and you could, you could pay me $20 to do it, I could take that money, right? So ownership typically involves a variety of different rights and we own different things in different ways. I, you know, I have a dog, hopefully she won't start barking while we're on this call. Uh, and I don't own her the way I own the phone. Like I'm not free to destroy the dog at will. I'm not free to alter the dog at will the way I am to the phone. Um, I own a house, I own guitars, I own other stuff. They all are slightly different property rights, but fundamentally it's, you can think of a property right as a right of exclusion that also includes some of these other rights to varying degrees. Why would anyone want that in a utopian world, right? Now, economists have lots and lots of arguments about why private property is important, but some of these arguments do not apply in utopia. So a very common argument that economists will make is if everything is left in the collective, people will destroy it. And so we need to like privatize and parcel, parcel and privatize things. I literally play a game with my students where I have them take their own property and have it be socialist for a week. And then I ask them what happens and it inevitably gets overused and destroyed. Typically when everything is held together, it's treated as expendable. No one really invests in it and it becomes a tragic commons. The climate is a good example. No one owns the climate and look how we treat it. Um, that's a great argument for private property, but it does not apply under utopian conditions because people are not willing to free ride and take advantage of one another if they're morally good. So we have to kind of go to more highfalutin arguments rather than the arguments economists typically give. Um, so here's some things that we could say. One thing is that part of what makes life meaningful for most of us is pursuing long-term projects, but we're material people living in a material world. For most of us, that's going to require having sustained at will access to particular goods that are ours. Um, for instance, uh, I have a bunch of guitars in a room right over there and a bunch of amplifiers and effects processors and things like that. And as a person who avidly plays guitar a lot, I, I spend more time playing live music at this point than I spend teaching. Uh, and I'm not bragging. It's nothing special, but that's just literally true. Uh, like, um, I have to have stuff that's set up the way I want it. I don't just need a guitar. I need a guitar a certain way, at will, set up the way I need it with effects the right way, sounding the right way, the knobs the right way, et cetera, et cetera. And if I don't have access to that, it really interferes with my ability to be a guitarist the way that I want. Now, Jerry Cohen agrees. He actually says, that's totally fine. You should have uh, goods like that for your own personal consumption. For him though, the problem becomes if I then make money on it, which I make a very small amount per year. Um, so when I play guitar for free, he's like, that's cool. That can totally be your guitar. But if I were to try to charge someone money for me to do it, then he's like, oh, now it's a problem. Now it becomes a good that you're making money from. But he admits like for these sorts of reasons, you should have your own personal property. Okay? But why can't you make money off of it? What's wrong with that? We'll get back to in a second. There's also this idea that we want to be at home in the world. And that means having spaces that are ours, that we shape our way. Right? And that means not just living in a house, but having a house your way that you've set up the way that you prefer. 
these body these arguments I'm taking from socialists. This is what they say about why you need stuff. Um, we recognize that if everything were collectively owned, asking permission to use it all the time would be kind of oppressive. I mean, imagine like, um, let's say you're a guitarist like I am. Every time you wanted to play guitar, you had to like go up to Sign Up Genius and like get permission for, to get guitars from the collective guitar uh, bin. Wouldn't that kind of suck? Wouldn't it be better if you just have your own? There's also things about things like, uh, you know, being sentimental for particular objects and so on. There's a few kinds of other kinds of arguments, right? And the thing is, socialists would agree that this matters um, when it comes to a lot of productive work. You know, for instance, Jerry Cohen didn't do a lot of co-authoring. It wasn't like every single time he sat down to write a paper, he said, okay, well, I'm a collectivist, so let's have this be collectively written. Okay, philosophy world, what's the, what are we going to write about? We're going to write about this topic? Okay, we voted. Now, what's the first sentence? The first word's going to be the, okay, let's take a vote for the second word. The second word's social, okay. Like, he would hate that. He recognizes that as a productive worker himself, writing so papers defending socialism, he wants to write them privately. If he understands that about his own case, why couldn't he say the same thing about Willie the Giant or Professor Von Drake or Minnie, uh, Minnie Mouse? Minnie wants, doesn't just want to make bows. Like she doesn't just want to work in the collectivist bow factory. She wants to be an entrepreneur who has a particular vision of how to sell bows. And she wants to test that on the market. In fact, it's important to her that it be tested on the market. It's important that people buy those bows because they want them and not as a favor to her, right? As a way of illustrating that, think of um, in the 1990s, there was a version of the, of the uh, Great Expectations book that uh, starred Ethan Hawke. And it's a little bit different from the novel. So I'll talk about the movie. He's early on as a child, he saves this convict and later he becomes an artist and he finds out that he thinks he's a great artist. He's selling all of his work, but it turns out that all of his art is being bought by that convict. Um, he doesn't know, he finds this out later that convict has since become rich and buys all of his art as a way of saying thank you. When he discovers this, he's absolutely devastated, right? You would think he'd, he'd be happy. No, he's not. Because what that means is that person wasn't buying the art because they liked the art. They were buying the art as a way of doing a favor to him, which means they don't actually value it the way that he wants them to. Cohen would admit that when it comes to art. He would admit that when it comes to his own work. Once he sees that, he could say the same thing about Willie the Giant selling cabbage or Minnie Mouse selling bows, right? It's the same kind of deal. In the same rate that like we as philosophers don't just write all of our papers collectively, you can understand why people might want to own their own farm or own their own factory and test these things on the market, right? So I think basically you're just taking their argument for private property elsewhere and private action elsewhere and applying it somewhere else. Now, they have lots of complaints about the markets. They go exploitation, et cetera. But these things don't apply under utopian markets. No one exploits one another. No one mistreats one another. So these complaints are only about realistic markets. Okay, fair enough. So I'm just borrowing their arguments on behalf of markets. Finally, there's a claim that markets serve the common good. And this is really important. All right, so imagine I had a magic wand. And when I wave this magic wand, it makes everyone 30 times richer. Should I wave the magic wand? Jerry Cohen would say yes, because in his view, money is freedom. A $20 bill is a ticket to the world. And the more of this you have, the more you're able to do. Imagine instead of having a magic wand, we have a wise philosopher queen who comes up with an economic plan. And she says, here's how my plan is going to work. You each get a bunch of different options. But if you all go along with my plan, um, like you're a farmer, like I'll give you a choice between you know, a farmer and a mortician. If you're an accountant or a doctor, whatever. So you're not being pushed around too much. If we all go along with my plan, we'll all become 30 times richer over time. It'll be as if we wave that magic wand. Should we go along with the plan? Jerry Cohen would be like, absolutely, we should. That's his view. She's supposed to be almost like a socialist planner. But then he admits, we don't have any wise philosopher queens. The world doesn't work this way. We can't be smart enough to be a wise philosopher queen. Well, what is a market? If you take Econ 101 and, and keep going, what you learn is, especially in price theory, a market is kind of like this philosopher queen and kind of like this magic wand. The market forces of supply and demand direct us on how to make ourselves useful to others in ways that promote their welfare. Now, in the real world, where most of us are very selfish, we don't care that much about other people's welfare. But Minnie Mouse, Mickey Mouse, and the other people who live in the anarcho-capitalist -cap utopia of the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, they really do. They really care about the welfare of distant strangers. And so one reason they want to live in markets is in order to unleash the productive power of markets to promote the welfare of others. And this argument, by the way, Cohen accepts. He accepts that markets work this way. He accepts the information point, right? So basically, you can take these sentimental and more moralistic arguments and use them on behalf of markets, and it gives you a case of why, even in utopian conditions, people would want private property and the means of production and buying and trading and something like a free market. One final question would be, what would you choose? 
which would you choose? I've given this talk at places that are overwhelmingly left-wing and anti-market. I've given the talk in front of libertarians. I've given the talk in front of conservatives. Uh, interestingly, almost everyone says, if I ask them, which would you rather live under? The Mickey Mouse clubhouse world with, let's say, humans rather than animals or the socialist camping trip? Almost everyone, including left-wing people, say they'd rather live under capitalist utopia than socialist utopia. But it's a trick question because capitalism does not make you choose. And that's one reason why it's better, right? In fact, even though the Mickey Mouse clubhouse world is fundamentally capitalist and has a capitalist superstructure, they would be totally fine if the Smurfs moved in and had a little commune among themselves. There's no rule that you can't be communal. In fact, I live in a commune with four people, right? My family and a dog. Uh, you can have a commune, you're just not required to. You can have communal things, you're just not required to. So in a way, that's one of the things that makes capitalism in the utopian conditions better. It doesn't forbid socialist utopia, it allows it. So Cohen, maybe a way of putting this is something like, Cohen is offering us a vision of utopia that's one way, and capitalist utopia could be many different things. And this is actually important because uh, when people think about utopian conditions, they're often trying to picture just one way of living for everybody. But in fact, given how different and how much diversity there is among us, probably your ideal society is different from mine. And what's really going on here is you have a kind of capitalist superstructure that allows people to try out lots of different other ways of living as long as they respect other people's willingness to live in different ways and ability to live in different ways. Oddly, I think what Cohen ended up doing was defending uh, inadvertently Cohen's argument for utopia, when you realize what's going wrong with it and you fix it, what he shows is that Robert Nozick's idea of utopia that he defended in his 74 book, um, Anarchy State Utopia, is actually the best way. So sort of summarize all this, um, Jerry Cohen is, I think, the best voice for the claim that socialism is what we would live under if we were morally perfect. But when we look really carefully at his argument, and it's the best one out there, we see what he's really saying is ideal socialism is better than realistic capitalism which he admits is probably better than realistic socialism. This might be true, but this leaves open the question of ideal capitalism versus ideal socialism. I think what I've argued is ideal capitalism is better than ideal socialism in part because ideal capitalism allows you to have ideal socialism at the same time. So therefore, at every level, the ideal and the non-ideal level, capitalism beats socialism. Notice I haven't said capitalism in the real world is perfect. I haven't said anything about how free market we should be in the real world. I've left all these things open, but I'm just talking about ideal theory versus realistic theory. Should we fundamentally have a, a capitalist economy or fundamentally have a socialist economy? And in both cases, I think capitalism fundamentally wins. Uh, so thanks very much. And I'm happy to take questions and comments at this point. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brennan. So if you have any questions, please uh, put it in the QA. We already have a couple. So the first one is, what do you think about a most fundamental critique of modern society and capitalism in general by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which more or less tells us that, in fact, commercial society pushes us away from any kind of utopia? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I reread Rousseau quite a bit recently. Um, and I'm not someone who's generally a fan of him, but I, I like him more now than I did 10 years ago. You know, I think the issue with Rousseau is he's starting with an empirically false account of what it was like before we were living together in society and an empirically false account of what early society might have been like. And so he's telling a story about how markets corrupted us, um, even though like, you know, he's not, he doesn't describe there being like a socialist golden age that's followed by markets. He describes people basically as being like primitive cave people brutes who then start living together and invent property and other things that makes us worse off. So it, I just think empirically speaking, he's wrong. In fact, a more accurate account would be something like what David Hume thinks. Uh, thousands of years, like many tens of thousands of years ago, almost all human beings were living in small family clans that were at constant war with all the other family clans. The overwhelming majority of men would die in violence and the large majority of women would be subject to capture and rape through these kinds of violent conflicts. And then over time, we became civilized in the sense of starting agrarian societies with a sense of property and ownership and some degree of trade. And as we've become more civilized in that sense, we become more peaceful, open, and tolerant. So I think Rousseau just has the empirics wrong. He's describing what he describes as his pre-civilization description of like what we're like before we're living together isn't something any of us would want to live under. Even he admits that. He's like, it sucks. I wouldn't want to go back to that. But he still thinks it's sort of degraded us in various ways. And I just don't think that's true. Um, I think empirically speaking, despite the rampant flaws in human nature. And I'm I'm not an optimist. I if you if you take classes with me, I teach classes on human behavior, you'll know my view is people are quite bad. 
But nevertheless, I think we're significantly better than we used to be. And the places where people are generally the best are generally market-based societies. Is there something intrinsically morally good or bad about the markets of the state that is different from the moral agency of the individuals that compose it? Uh, you said the, the fundamentally about the market itself or the state. Do you want me to talk about yes. both? Yeah. Yes. Uh, good. So one way of thinking about markets is, I'm going to give you an illustration, actually, it's a bit of a side thing. Um, uh, a, a couple of years ago, uh, Nando's Perry Perry, the chicken chain, had this advertisement and this little stunt that they did in New York, I think it was in New York City, where they you could walk in one day and they would ask you, would you like to get a, a non-democratic meal? And what happened if you got the non-democratic meal was um, someone in the back would, you're like, I'll take the non-democratic meal. What Someone in the back would just throw together a bunch of ingredients and serve that to you. It might be like a brownie with um, chicken sauce, like a spicy chicken sauce on top of it and like a chicken nugget and some mashed potato oh, never mind, and some rice. It'd be like the disgusting thing. And they're like, aha, doesn't this, and they said, that's what it's like in a dictatorship. Doesn't that tell you that dictatorship is bad? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because they did not actually give you a democratic meal, right? There are, the, what, the normal thing that happens when you go to Nando's Peri Peri is you get a market meal. The way a market meal works is you walk in and they have a menu and you say, I want this. And then they give it to you. And if you don't like what's on the menu, you walk, if you don't like their kind of food, you just walk out and go somewhere else. So a market meal would be, you get what you want. The fundamental thing in markets is you interact with other on the basis, others on the basis of mutual consent for mutual benefit. A democratic meal, which is sort of the, maybe the best form of the state that we've ever come up with would be something like this. You go to Nando Perry's Perry's and you tell them what you want. And then they ask everyone else what they want and whatever the plurality of people want is what we get. So I walk in there and I say, um, I want a, uh, what is it called? Ninduco's choice. I don't remember the word. Ninduco's choice chicken with uh triple X extra spicy sauce. And they're like, great, here's your um, chicken side with mild sauce because most people don't want that stuff. That would be a democratic meal. You get what the majority wants or the plurality if there isn't a majority, right? So I think fundamentally what markets are is interaction on the basis of mutual consent, where we have the right to say no. Democracy is not that. That's like the best form of the state that we've come up with. Instead, it's going to be something more like the largest group gets its way and everyone else lives with it. But you have the option, perhaps, of somehow maybe forming a, a majority at some point. Right. So I think that's the fundamental difference between them if we're comparing the best of the market with the best of the state. Right. How fruitful is to have this kind of debates about around the ideal types if by definition utopia is impossible to achieve? I think it's actually really important because uh, the reason people bring this up is because that's they know that they're not going to win the other kind of argument, right? I think lots of people, including people who defend markets, including economists who are very enthusiastic about markets or others, have this view that like markets are kind of inherently shady. It's like we sort of feel bad about them. We're like, uh... Well, we've got the market, but it's a little bit like living in a market is a little bit like giving my kid a vaccine. You know, it's like on one hand, like the fact that I have a polio vaccine that I can give my children is amazing. Like they're never going to get polio. That's amazing. But on the other hand, it hurts. It sucks to get it, right? It'd be better if we just didn't need it at all. And so people at the best, they're kind of like markets are like the polio vaccine. It's sort of like, oh, it's just too bad we have to have them. And when you have that kind of view, this sort of nagging in the back of your mind suspicion that markets are fundamentally immoral, that opens you up to being manipulated by demagogues. It opens you up to people who say they have a better way. It opens up this moral enthusiasm where like, we're going to fix everything and make it great because we, we all are kind of suspicious of the world we live under. And then those people come to power and make things much worse. So I think it really is important that you be able to defend markets on a moral argument and not simply on a kind of purely consequentialist comparative institutional argument. Um, another way of putting it is if you concede the moral high ground to the other side, the other side is going to seize power and they're not going to do good things with it. I and mean, they haven't yet. As I said, in the 20th century, they went zero for 90. So when people in this century say they're going to go one, one for one, I don't believe them. Is there any alternative to both markets or state or capitalism, socialism? Is there a third way? Yeah. And in fact, in capitalist societies and actually in socialist societies to a lesser extent, you already see that third way. It's not every it's not as if everything is done on the basis of market transactions. You know, both socialism and capitalism are about the use of property and the control of property and who makes decisions over it. But there's a third way, what um 
say de Tocqueville called civil society, right? Or association. People interact with one another, not really thinking about property and volunteer to do things together in ways that aren't really about the use of property. Um, we work together or or maybe we, we have property, but we don't collectively own it per se, and we don't also trade with one another. So I think about the kinds of volunteering that people do, especially popular in the US. I think of like booster organizations, like my kids are in high school and like the booster organizations that make it so that like they can do really fancy plays and things like that. Um, that's civil society. Uh, you know, if I'm, uh, I'm about next week, I'm going to start playing um, music for a high school pit orchestra that's going to be doing a musical because they my, were friends with somebody who, a theater teacher, and I guess they don't have a kid who can play guitar for them. Uh, I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it to be nice. Uh, but a lot of people come together to make this thing work. That's civil society or in my neighborhood, we have this civic association that does a lot of things to keep the neighborhood looking nice and better and, and make life better for one another. That's civil society. So I, I tend to think of it as there's collectively held property that's socialistly owned in socialist systems like roads and things. We have privately held property and then we have this other thing, civil society. And you know, generally speaking, civil society is larger in market-based capitalist societies than it is in socialist societies. So one of the reasons why I think capitalism works better in the real world is because capitalism is very good at enabling its alternatives. Okay, I think we have reached the end of the question. So we are grateful for having you and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, appreciate it. So if there is no more, we can finish. Well, thank you everyone. We appreciate Thank you very much. Thank you. See you guys later. Thank you. So, well, goodbye, everyone. And see you next week with the session by Andre on economic instability and financial crisis.